Welcome to Vera Voices. I'm Don Steeman, co-author with Bruce Frederick of the Anatomy of Discretion, an NIJ-funded research project that examines prosecutorial decision-making. I'm here today with Ann Swern, first assistant district attorney in the Kings County, New York District Attorney's Office. And one of the things we found in our study was that external factors were affecting prosecutorial decision-making. The availability of courtrooms, the number of judges, uh, to hear cases, the number of days that, that courtrooms were open affected which cases prosecutors could try, um, how they decided plea bargains, and how they decided to dispose of cases before trial. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me how concerned should we be that external resource constraints are affecting how prosecutors make decisions in cases and how they approach cases? I would be concerned about it, and I am concerned about it. For example, if a courtroom closes at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and your witness can only come to testify after 4 o'clock, that witness may not be available for trial. Well, do you try the case? Do you offer a plea bargain that's less than what you think is just? And there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of when those resources, those external resources are depleted, it affects how a prosecutor goes forward in a case, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that. It should be the evidence, it should be the facts of the case, what the crime charges, and it should be who the defendant is, meaning what the criminal history is. Mm -hmm. um, and once it's things beyond that that don't have to do with justice, it would it's of grave concern and it should be addressed. Mm -hmm. What are some specific strategies that chief prosecutors could take to respond to external constraints, things or these external resource constraints, things outside their office? Well, I think that prosecutors could prioritize the work be sensitive to the community concerns that you know change pretty frequently and adjust the resources in their offices to fit the needs of the community and the needs of the justice system. The other thing is that you would prioritize the kinds of cases that you're taking in. Prosecutorial discretion has a tremendous amount of latitude about what kinds of cases you go forward with. Obviously cases where there's not enough evidence are the first type of cases you won't go forward even if the police bring it to you. And I've heard many of my colleagues refusing to take cases, mm -hmm. classes of cases, types of cases, because of their own depleted resources and the depleted resources around them in in the criminal justice system. So in, in the two offices that we looked at, they, they had two different strategies. Uh, the one office shifted much of their staff and resources to the screening decision, mm -hmm. hoping to weed out cases, not just that didn't have strong evidence, but also cases that they didn't meet the priorities of the office. Uh, the other office, it, rather than doing that, um, did what they called roundtabling cases, where when trials, uh, weren't, when courtrooms weren't available and they had to rethink which cases were going to trial, the prosecutors got together in an individual unit, put all the cases together and said which of these now can go forward. Do you think that, that one of those strategies is stronger than the other? Do you think there's a, an ideal way to distribute resources within the prosecutor's office when they're met with these external constraints? I would say it depends on the size of the office. Ideally you would have that assessment at every step of the prosecution. Mm -hmm. Ideally you would certainly have it at intake because Cases that shouldn't be in the system shouldn't be in the system for whatever reason it is. Whether it's an evidentiary reason, whether it's a, a prosecutor, elected prosecutor's decision in terms of exercising discretion at the at the first instance. Thereafter, every other point because cases change. Witnesses' interests in the cases change. Their availability change. The defendant, um, what's going on with the defendant, what's going on with the defendant's life changes. There's so many things that a case is not fixed in a moment in time and the best prosecutor's offices would constantly reevaluate whether or not it's appropriate to go forward, what the appropriate plea offer is, mm -hmm. and a good defense attorney um, responds to that and a good judge is responds to that and that's a, the perfect um, set of circumstances where justice is done. So we talked a, a bit about strategies the chief prosecutor could adopt within their own office, redistributing their own resources in their office to respond to these external resource constraints. How can they work to bolster the resources that are placing constraints on them from outside? You know, they call it a criminal justice system as if it was created exactly in a moment in time by one entity and this part was going to do this and this part was going to do that, but it's really not that way. There are component parts of something that create a system. Sometimes we find that we duplicate each other's efforts unknowingly or unwittingly and the more 
more we collaborate and find out when we are duplicating each other's efforts, the better it is to streamline those efforts, and I think that it creates resources. We look at the component parts as, as very disparate and having very diff different responsibilities. A prosecutor has very different responsibilities from a criminal defense. It's not the mirror image of each other, but frequently funders look at criminal justice as an entity. So if they're giving it to the police, they're taking it away from the defense. If they're giving it to the defense, they're taking it away from the prosecutors because there's one pot of money for criminal justice. That's why it behooves us to work together to figure out if there are creative solutions because one day they're taking it away from one component part and the next day they're taking it away from the other component part, but we have to all do justice. Even though our mission is a little bit different, at the end we want to see justice done. And that sounds like a perfect place to end this interview. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.